Thank you very much. Uh, it's a, a real pleasure to be speaking in this workshop among so many uh, other very interesting talks. Uh, and today I'm going to tell you about some of the work that I've been doing with my student, Davis Skilton, and uh, postdoc, soon to be faculty member, uh, Greg Anji. So ultimately, the kinds of inverse problems that we're considering in this talk are inverse problems that arise in imaging. So the idea is that we have an image beta that ultimately we'd like to recover. But instead of observing it directly, instead we observe projections of it. So we'll have a matrix X that represents those projections and what we observe is a vector Y of, of these projections plus some noise. And so ultimately our goal is to recover the image beta from the observation Y. So this is a, problem, a pretty generic representation of a problem that shows up in all different kinds of applications, uh, in painting, deblurring, super resolution, uh, MRI, radar, and, and many others. It's a classical problem that's um, been thought about in mathematical circles for, for a very long time. Uh, and one of the oldest uh, approaches dates back to uh, Tikhonov back in the 1940s. And to understand where uh, this perspective came from, let's just take a, let's just think about a simple example of deblurring. So in the upper left here, I've got an example of a blurred image. And next to it, I've got that same blurred image with a tiny bit of noise. Uh, and the noise is, is imperceptible. You probably can't see it over Zoom, but I also can't see it uh, in, the, in the images as, as I display them on my screen. So what you might consider doing, given the formulation on the previous slide, is just computing uh, an estimate using least squares. And if you have no noise, like we have on the left, then this works very, very well. But in situations where we have noise, this can be pretty problematic. Because this matrix here that we invert, x transpose x, may have some very small singular values. And so when we invert it, then we get some very large entries that when multiplied by the noise inside Y result in solutions that look terrible. Um, and essentially the, the noise times this uh, inverse problem operator uh, completely obliterates any signal about the underlying image. So taking off no, regularization or in statistical circles referred to as ridge regression uh, says, instead of just trying to minimize our sum of squared errors, Let's also try to make sure that the sum of the squared pixel values in our reconstruction are not too small. I'm sorry, not too big. So the idea is that all of these giant pixels in this terrible reconstruction, we're gonna to try to damp those down. And it turns out that you can write a closed form solution to this problem, which looks a lot like the least square solution, except we've got a scaled identity matrix in here that ensures that this sum is well conditioned and we can compute the inverse and therefore suppress this, this, the effect of this noise. Okay, so if we see this in action, what we see is we get a reasonable estimate. It's imperfect and there's some ringing and other artifacts, but it's certainly better than what we would get with these squares. So this is an early and very simple example of using regularization or of, of tacking on some criterion about the image onto our error function, where that criterion is used to give us a better conditioned estimate that reflects some uh, prior knowledge about the image. Uh, in this case, the prior knowledge is that none of the pixels are too giant, but there are many other kinds of prior knowledge. One example of regularization is, for to uh, is total variation. So for an image, what I might do is I might compute all of its first, and, uh, first order pixel differences, both horizontally and vertically, and construct a regularizer that measures the sum of the absolute values of all of those differences. Uh, other kinds of regularization try to promote sparsity of an image in a wavelet basis, or reflect the notion that if we were to take lots of little patches in an image, then there's a fair amount of redundancy among those patches or that we can, or we can model the underlying subspace or manifold that those patches lie in and leverage that in order to perform denoising. So today what I'd like to discuss is um, how we might be able to move beyond this notion of choosing a regularizer based on notions of smoothness or geometric models, and instead learning a regularizer from training data. So throughout, we're gonna think about this, this general kind of framework where 
we're, our goal is to be able to take an image Y and feed it into a box that we can think of as trying to find an image that is a good fit to the data and has a small value of some regularization function R, an output data hat. And so the question really becomes, how do we choose this R and how can we leverage training data to make good practical choices for R? So there's been a lot of work done in this general area of trying to use training data to figure out good ways to regularize uh, solvers for inverse problems. Uh, and rather than give you a giant list of all of the different variants that have been um, published recently, I'd instead like to go through some of the major classes of different approaches and show you a representative example in each one of these classes that'll help us understand some of the trade-offs uh, involved in this, in this general problem setting. So the first class that I want to describe is what I call model agnostic. And what I mean by that is that for the most part, we are learning how to solve the inverse problem by uh, ignoring any knowledge of X, our forward model. So a nice example of this might be with super resolution where uh, researchers proposed taking a low resolution image and then mapping it up to the desired resolution and then training a neural network to essentially remove blur and artifacts and other effects of that initial um, upsampling step to yield a nice attractive reconstruction. So there is some rough knowledge of X in this process in the sense that we've done some initial pre-processing, taking Y and gotten an initial estimate of beta that we're then going to refine. But this is very far from solving a least squares problem or doing some Tikhonov regularization or what have you. This is really just doing some very loose, very rough, um, approximation conceptually to the inverse of X. And then we use our training data to figure out the best way to remove those artifacts. So as in the super resolution case, there have been examples of this method working well in practice, uh, but for the most part, it works best when we can get a pretty decent initial estimate. And when the inverse problem forward model X, that we, the thing we ultimately want to invert is not too far from the identity matrix. So as we work with less and less kind of benign inverse problems, this method uh, becomes less and less effective. And essentially the reason for that is because when we are training this network, we have to learn not only something about the geometry of images, but we also have to learn something about everything that we haven't used about the forward model X. And so our learning tasks becomes more complex in this model agnostic approach. Okay, so the next class of methods I want to describe is uh, decoupled. So by this, I mean, we essentially have two things that we need to do. One is we wanna use our training data in order to learn something about images. And second, we want to figure out what the underlying image beta is from the observations using the forward model. So decoupled approaches kind of separate out the use of the training data and use of the forward model X. So let me show you an example of that. So let's imagine that uh, again, we have this basic framework that we started off with where we're ultimately gonna choose an image that is a good fit to the data and is a small value of our regularization function. So then we could imagine saying, what if we knew some sort of low dimensional manifold that contained all of the images of interest uh, that we might want to reconstruct? Then it would make sense to say, well, I'm only going to allow beta hat to be something on this manifold. So I would maybe design a regularizer that's zero for any beta on the manifold and infinity otherwise. And hopefully this is going to result in good reconstructions. So this is not a new concept, but of course the challenge is that in general, we don't know what the um, uh, manifold is. So we can't explicitly construct this R of beta in general. Okay, so here's how we might approach this using training data. So in particular, what we might do is try to learn a generative model or a generator G 
where we can feed in some input. And what will be output is going to be some image on this manifold. And so scanning through different inputs Z, we're going to get a whole bunch of different images on this manifold. So if I had a generative model like this, then I could think about writing my regularizer as being either zero for any image beta that could be um, uh, produced by this generator G and otherwise is infinity. Okay, so fortunately there's been a lot of really uh, excellent work on trying to learn generative models uh, and this has been well studied. And so what we can do is we can actually use our training data to learn this generative model G. And once we have it, then we can try to actually solve our inverse problem. So I can say my estimate beta hat is going to be the minimum of all the betas that might be produced by my generator of the, the squared error. Okay, so this was proposed um, a few years ago by a group at UT Austin. And one of the very nice features of this approach is that I can do all of my training of my generator um, before I even know what kind of inverse problem I might wanna solve. And so if I want to train a, a regularizer or a generator using a training data set, and then one day I wanna solve a deblurring problem and the next day I wanna solve an inverse painting problem, I have the flexibility to do that without having to retrain every single time I've got um, a new inverse problem I wanna solve. And this is what I mean by decoupled. I really have two phases in this process. First, I'm learning the generator. And second, I'm leveraging my forward model. And in the second phase, I don't use any, uh, I don't use the training data at all. I've just fixed the generator. And in the first phase, I'm not using any knowledge of the forward model X at all. Okay, so here's an example of this in action. I've got an original image of, of this woman but um, I only get to observe a subset of the pixels. So there's a big set of pixels in the middle of her face that are missing. And if we were to use this approach that I just described after it's been trained with say 80,000 pictures of people's faces nicely centered, uh, then it works pretty, pretty well. However, if we were to reduce the number of samples that we use to train the generative model, that um, is built on a convolutional neural network, then we see this method breaks down. Um, it doesn't, it not only is giving us poor results, which we would expect, but those results are um, just nonsensical. And so the question is, um, why is this? Why do we see this sort of dramatic breakdown and how can we potentially uh, circumvent it? And I want to emphasize that this problem that I'm, I'm going to highlight uh, is not limited to that one particular paper um, that's based on generative models. Rather, I would claim that this is a, a challenge associated with any method inside this category of decoupled approaches. So very quickly, you could imagine, I just want to show you an alternative decoupled approach where I could say, imagine that I knew what my regularizer was. Then I might imagine solving this problem, uh, finding a beta hat, by using, for instance, a, an optimization algorithm like proximal gradient. So at every iteration of K, I would take my current estimate and I would take a step in the direction of the negative gradient of my squared error term. And then I would take the result of that, ZK, and I would essentially do a denoising step using my regularizer. So one approach to decoupled learning to solve inverse problems is to say, let me train a neural network to perform denoising. So I'm implicitly learning a regularizer, not explicitly, but basically uh, learning how to do this regularized to denoising. And once I've learned that, then I can plug that back in to this proximal gradient method. So every time you give me a new X, I change this first step, but the second step remains the, um, the second step remains the same and uses my training data. So this is also an example of a decoupled approach where we suffer when we have a relatively small number of training samples. So if we were in a situation where we wanted to reconstruct images of things like cats, then maybe we don't care about 
how uh, sensitive we are to the number of training samples because we have an infinite supply of images of cats. But there are many applications, uh, for instance, medical imaging, where we have far fewer training samples available to us. And so developing methods that are going to work, even when we have a small number of training samples, is pretty essential. Okay, so let's think about why these decoupled approaches can be problematic. And I think the in-painting example that I talked about earlier is a, uh, gives us a nice sort of intuition. So imagine that I observe this image of the woman where a bunch of the pixels in her face are missing, and I wanna reconstruct her face. So what these decoupled methods do, um, essentially, is they're learning a model or a distribution over the space of all possible images and using that distribution to fill in the missing pixels with likely values. The problem with that general idea is that we have to learn this full distribution over all images. But for this in-painting problem, there's tons of pixels that are totally irrelevant to our task. So another way of saying this is that within this framework, I'm forced to learn a model for every pixel in the image, including the background pixels. And I'm leveraging my training data to try to learn that model, even though that part of the model is completely irrelevant to the task at hand. And so arguably what we should be looking at instead is a conditional distribution, the distribution of the missing pixels given the pixels that I uh, already observe. And there's a lot of literature um, in statistics that thinks about uh, how many samples we need to learn a full probability distribution versus a conditional distribution. And there are many examples that show that often this conditional distribution can be lower dimensional or smoother or have other properties that allow us to learn it with far fewer samples than we would need to estimate the full distribution. Another way of looking at this um, is, is the following. Let's imagine that we wanted to search over all possible reconstruction uh, mappings row. So row is gonna take as an input X beta, it's, gonna, it's going to take our obser observations, our projections, and it's going to output an estimate beta hat. And what we want to do is we want to choose rho so that on average, the distance between the beta hat that rho produces and the true beta that we want to reconstruct is small. Okay, so the very best possible rho that we might choose, the best possible reconstruction method we might choose, um, let's call that rho star. So we can actually work out what this rho star uh, might look like in the situation where X is a, a full rank matrix with fewer rows than columns. So it's an underdetermined system of equations that we're dealing with here. And in this setting, what we can show is that rho star, the, the um, mapping that makes our mean squared error as small as possible, has this particular form. First, I've got the pseudo inverse of X times Y. So this is something that I can just compute. I don't need any training data whatsoever. And that gets added to X perp transpose where X perp corresponds to the um, orthogonal subspace to X times the expected value of X perp beta given this pseudo inverse. So when we look at this expression, what we see at the end is that there are two kind of key components. One is something that we know and we can just compute. And the other is something that we need to learn. And this learned component ultimately depends on this conditional distribution. The distribution uh, in the context of the in-painting example, this is corresponding to essentially the distribution of the pixels that are missing given the pixels that are observed. Okay, so even from this perspective, which is a little less hand wavy than the previous slide, we see that um, this conditional density plays an essential role in getting good performance in, in reconstruction. And I think what we can conclude from this is that um, in general, we wanna focus on estimating this conditional density, but that conditional density is a function of our forward model X. 
So if X is known a priori, then we should be using it from the get-go during our learning process. And we should not be um, uh, trying to decouple the learning from the solving of the inverse problem. Okay, so this takes us back to the different classes of methods that we described. So first we were looking at agnostic methods that ignore X entirely. Then we looked at decoupled methods that only consider X after the fact. And now we're going to consider methods that incorporate X um, from the beginning throughout the whole learning process. And to start, we're going to look at unrolled optimization approaches. So let's imagine for the moment that we knew the regularizer and that it was differentiable. Then I might try to compute an estimate by solving this optimization problem just using simple gradient descent where my update equations look like this expression here. So I can rewrite this process or uh, this, this uh, gradient descent process uh, as a block diagram. So if I only allow myself B iterations of gradient descent, then I've got B different blocks here with this dashed outline. And within each block, I've got two parallel kind of side branches. The first one is taking steps in the direction of the negative gradient of my, my cost function relative to my forward model. So I'm leveraging my forward model and my data. And the parallel branch is taking into account my regularizer or the gradient of my regularizer. And so I can do this B different times. Okay, so this is what I might do if I knew my regularizer or I knew its gradient. So what unrolled optimization approaches do is they say, well, let's replace this um, gradient of a regularizer, which we don't know, with a learned neural network. And now what we're going to do is we're going to think about this whole big block diagram as one system. And we're going to try to train the weights of the neural network in order to ensure that the output of this diagram beta hat is as close as possible to the original beta uh, that we want to reconstruct as possible. So in contrast to what we talked about before with proximal gradient methods that were decoupled, here we are taking into account the X matrix, our forward model, throughout the training process because we're ultimately going to have a loss function that depends on the output of this block diagram. And that output of the block diagram, of course, depends on X. And so as we chain, train our neural network, we're taking X to in, to, into account explicitly. Okay, now I'm also going to present an alternative that doesn't use this optimization framework as a starting point, but instead uses uh, a Neumann series starting point. So again, we're going to imagine for a moment that we know a good regularizer, R, and that it is differentiable. And so what we might do then is we might try to take a page from the Tikhonov regularization book and say, if I knew this regularizer and its gradient, then I can write down what estimate I'd like to be able to compute. And I can take this inverse operator here in my first factor and expand it using a Neumann series. And so again, similar to what we did with the gradient descent network, I can truncate the series, so I only have B terms, and write this in a block diagram. And again, within each block, I've got two sort of branches, one that takes my forward model X into account, and the other that accounts for my regularized gradient. And then again, we can replace the gradient of my regularizer with a neural network that I can then train from end to end. So here we could do a compare and contrast between the gradient descent network and this network based on the Neumann series. And we see that they've got some commonalities. Uh, they both have these B different blocks. They both have a learned component and a component that depends on our forward model X. But one of the things that differentiates them is that the Neumann network, because of the Neumann series that we use as a starting point, cleaves off the estimate or the output of each one of these blocks. And our final uh, estimate beta hat is the sum of the outputs of all the intermediate blocks. So in contrast with the gradient descent network, we're just seeing what comes out of the last block. And so anything we do in the first block 
it has to go through a whole lot more steps before we feel its effect in the output. Whereas with the Neumann network, because we're summing the outputs of all the blocks, then we get, um, if, if we were to do some kind of tweak in the first block, we feel it relatively immediately in our output beta hat. And we believe that this allows these networks to be optimized and trained uh, more easily, that the optimization landscape that we have to navigate when we perform back propagation uh, allows us to find good local minimizers uh, more, more often and more uh, accurately. Another nice feature of this Neumann network is that we can uh, connect it with this minimum mean squared error optimal reconstruction method that I talked about before. So remember we said rho star corresponded to the best possible mapping from uh, observations y to an estimate beta hat and that it had this form that I have on the top line. Well, what I can do is I can um, actually rewrite this expression where I take the pseudo inverse in the first um, uh, term and I expand it using a Neumann series. And I recognize that the second term corresponds to something that depends on the conditional density. And now what I can do is I can compare that with what's actually being computed by this Neumann network that I just described. And what I see is that essentially my estimate has got the same known component that the um, optimal reconstruction method would have. And it's got a learned component that corresponds exactly to this conditional density that we thought should really be at the heart of any learned reconstruction method. Okay, so you might ask, you know, in what sense does this really make sense? Because we started off with the Neumann series. So imagine that I've got an operator A. If A is a linear operator, then the identity minus A inverse has this Neumann series expansion. But as soon as A becomes a nonlinear operator, then that whole uh, equivalence breaks down. And so for our setting with the Neumann networks, if we're using say ReLU neural networks, all of a sudden we've got some pretty strong nonlinearities in our estimate. And so you might ask, well, is it really justifiable to use this Neumann series as a starting point or is it totally ad hoc? Um, which is a, a pretty fair question. So I wanna dive into that uh, a little bit more before we look at some empirical results. So in particular, I wanna consider what would happen if our images, our betas, belong to a union of low dimensional subspaces. So this is a model that's been widely used in uh, image processing and computational imaging. Uh, an early example corresponds to the Yale B uh, face data set. Um, but we're going to think about using this model to represent the space of possible images or this image manifold that we're interested in. Now, we're not going to assume that we know what this union of subspaces is. We're still using exactly the same Neumann network that I described before. We're just gonna ask the question, if all of our training data did lie on a union of subspaces, how would the Neumann network behave in that setting? Okay, so in particular, what we can show under some, some relatively benign um, assumptions is that if we were to consider what the optimal regularizer gradient, grad R is in this union of subspaces setting, it should be piecewise linear in beta. So in other words, if I were to have an image beta and I wanna compute the optimal regularizer gradient, then it would correspond to a linear operator times beta where for all the betas that correspond to one subspace and then a different linear operator times beta for all the betas that belong to the next subspace. So the union of subspaces structure of the betas leads to a piecewise linear uh, optimal gradient. So this is what we would hope that we would ultimately learn uh, since this is what we would strive for if we knew the union of subspaces in advance. If we were to build this Neumann network with ReLU activation units, then we can very closely approximate this piecewise linear structure. So it's well known that ReLU networks output piecewise linear functions. And so 
um, the whole setting that we're using is consistent with this optimal regularizer. In addition, remember that when we had that Neumann network, we had B different blocks and we were cleaving off the outputs of all those different blocks. What we can show is that if we train this network with data from a union of subspaces, then the outputs from all of those different blocks are going to correspond to exactly the same subspace. So in other words, if you just hand me a beta from one of the subspaces in this union of subspaces, then the gradient of the regularizer that I learn with my Neumann network, that's going to behave linearly. So even though overall, we're learning something that's nonlinear or piecewise linear, uh, for any particular fixed input, we have uh, this network behaving like a linear operator, which allows us to say that this Neumann series foundation is, is justifiable and isn't causing us any major distortions. So there are three kind of key ramifications of the, the theory that I just presented. First of all, what we said is that um, capital R, which corresponds to the gradient of our regularizer, little r, that should somehow reflect the union of subspaces structure. Certainly the, the optimal one does, and we hope that our learned one does. Secondly, all the outputs of all the blocks are going to be in the same subspace. And finally, um, our gradient of our regularizer is only going to affect our, our reconstruction uh, in the null space of our forward model X. And this is something that we can actually um, test. So we, we generated a very simple um, toy model where we had data from a union of subspaces. Um, so we were just observing little length eight 1D signals um, from a union of subspaces. And we chose our forward model X so that we only observe the first four entries. And our goal was to estimate the last four entries. And so what we can do is we can look at um, the output of all of the different blocks. And what we can see is that um, the outputs of the blocks essentially all correspond to the same subspace like the theory predicted. And when we look at the learned components of the outputs, they all are only affecting our estimate in the null space, which corresponds to the last four entries because we only observe the first four entries. Finally, we can take that learned network and we can see whether it is reflecting the union of subspace of structure and we find that it is. So if we were to take two images or signals, beta one and beta two from the same subspace, then we see that our learned regularizer gradient is acting like a linear operator. But if we were to take um, betas, two different betas from two different subspaces, one and two, then our learned regularizer gradient is no longer behaving like a linear operator. And so that union of subspaces structure that's in our training data um, is being essentially learned by this Neumann network architecture. Okay, so let's take a look at some examples. And before I do, I just want to mention very quickly that there's a, a fourth or fifth um, uh, method that I'm going to present, which basically takes the Neumann network, which I already presented to you, and tweaks it a little bit to precondition it. So before we started where the input to the network was simply X transpose times Y, now we're going to change it where our input corresponds to doing Tikhonov regularization, which we talked about way at the beginning. And we modify the blocks of the network to account for the fact that we're doing this, this different initialization. Okay, so we had four classes of methods and I'm going to show you results for one method from each class. Um, a residual autoencoder that corresponds to an agnostic method that doesn't really use X except for maybe some rough initialization. Uh, this generative model approach, which is decoupled because we train and then reconstruct. The unrolled gradient ascent and the Neumann network. So first I can just show you um, one simple like, visual anecdotal example um, where the uh, on the far left, I've got the original and then X transpose Y. So how all of these methods are, the input to each one of these methods. And then I can see the results of these four different approaches and their residuals. So the more black you see, the better the method is uh, because you've got fewer errors in the individual pixels. 
And so we can see that not only is the Neumann network producing fewer artifacts and giving generally good results, but also um, we're able to achieve good results even when the number of training samples we have is very small. Uh, and then of course, this isn't just for this example. So we did experiments for compressed sensing, super resolution, in painting, MRI, uh, of a bunch of different inverse problems for a bunch of different training data sets. And what we see is that consistently across training data set sizes uh, and consistently across different types of inverse problems, the Neumann network and moreover, this preconditioned version of the Neumann network uh, yields superior results. So I, I mentioned MRI um, a couple of times as one particularly strong motivating example. Um, so here's an example of this in action on MRI, and it's a little bit hard to see in the screen without a, a darkened room. Um, but one of the things I wanna emphasize is that some of the methods that I've been describing, like neural networks and preconditioned neural networks, uh, along with the, um, I guess, current state of the art for MR, learned MRI reconstruction called modal, uh, these methods kind of typically limit the number of blocks or the number of iterations that are used a priori. And that's extremely helpful in applications like MRI, where we want to restrict the amount of time that we're devoting to performing the reconstruction. So on the far right over here, I have the result of using total variation reconstruction, um, which is still quite good. But this took 350 seconds to compute using a state-of-the-art total variation solver. Um, and in contrast, these learned methods are all taking uh, about 15 seconds or, long, or, or fewer. So uh, quite a bit less than would be required with more conventional methods. So not only are we getting high quality results with um, low mean squared errors, but we're also able to do it much more rapidly than conventional methods. Now, all this said, I think there are a number of outstanding open questions that as a community, we really don't have answers to. And rather than thinking about how can I make the next tweak on the next algorithm to get the next lower mean squared error, uh, I feel like you know maybe trying to answer some of these questions or better understand these trade-offs uh, is a pr pretty key direction. So the first trade-off is generality versus sample complexity. And this is something that we touched on earlier. So if we know X, our forward model during training, then what we've seen is that using it during training gives us lower mean squared errors. So in other words, it lowers our sample complexity. But the trade-off there is that now we have to retrain our model every time we have a new inverse problem. I can't just train once and just be done with it. Um, and so I've got a much less general approach than these decoupled approaches are. Another key trade-off is reconstruction accuracy versus sensitivity to model mismatch. And I'm gonna show an example of this on the next slide. But imagine that X corresponds to an MRI scanner at a clinic. So I then use that X to train um, a um, inverse problem solver using say Neumann networks. And then my clinic buys a new MRI scanner that's essentially, I mean, it's still an MRI scanner, it's not that different. But because of calibration differences or, or other things, its forward model might correspond to X prime, which is only a little bit different from X. And a key thing that we don't completely understand is how badly these learned reconstruction methods are going to perform for X when, when X prime becomes our model instead of X. Um, another key challenge or, or trade-off that arises is uh, the trade-off between reconstruction speed and guarantees. So for instance, we talked about methods that were decoupled like these um, generative model methods or methods based on proximal gradient. And for those methods, once I've done all of my training, then I take my trained module and I, I plug it into some iterative solver. That means that I haven't tried to learn how to limit the number of iterations as much as, poss as possible. And so as a result, though that class of methods in general can be somewhat slower. On the other hand, I can then take those iterative methods and run them all the way to convergence. Whereas if I just say ahead of time, I'm only going to allow myself 10 blocks or 10 iterations, 
then it becomes much more difficult to characterize the performance or to understand the role of the number of blocks in the method. Finally, a big trade-off I see is between in-distribution versus out-of-distribution performance. Uh, so if I'm in an MRI context and I have a training data set of say brain scans, I don't have any notion of whether the tumors or lesions that appear in that training data set are representative of the kinds of tumors or lesions I might see in the next patient tomorrow. And so one of the key kind of questions in this field is how robust are these methods to the tumor lesion that I've never seen before? So let me show you a couple of pictures. First of all, um, here on the top is essentially what I was showing you earlier, where I've trained using a model of my MRI scanner, and then I tested it out on um, that same MRI scanner. So the X naught that I used for training is the same as the X naught that I used at test time. And I'm comparing that on the bottom with a situation where I train on one scanner, and then I try to take my learned module and make it work on a slightly different scanner. Um, so this is not a huge difference, it's still MRI, it's just that somehow maybe the exact locations in case space where I sample are, are shifted a little bit. And what we see is that across the board, we see a dip in performance as we change that forward model and try to reuse all of the learning that we've done. But one thing that's really unclear and unknown is how different kinds of architectures, how these different types of methods can help improve the robustness or what kinds of features of different architects lead to methods that are more robust or less robust. I've also got an example here where I, I trained the, and by I, I mean my student Davis, <laughs> trained these networks to reconstruct MRI images. Um, and I think those, the images in his training set all corresponded to healthy individuals. And then at test time, he took an image and he input a, um, an artificial, uh, in this case, square tumor. And he wanted to know how well would he be able to reconstruct this tumor that was unlike any tumor that was in our training data set. And so what I'm showing you is that reconstruction for each one of the of three different approaches. And we can see that for each, and then I've got a zoomed in version below. And so in each of these different methods, we do seem to recover it, but it also seems to produce some artifacts on either side. And we haven't learned how to dampen those artifacts because we don't have um, any example tumors of this form. So an open question becomes, how do we build methods that are going to be based on training data and yet still robust to features that might never appear in our training data? I believe that the answer to this um, is a transition from trying to model or learn the uh, geometry of entire images to taking images and breaking them into patches and trying to use our neural networks to learn that patch geometry. So the idea would be that to regularize or let's say denoise an image for instance, I would take an image extract all of its patches and subtract the means, then send it through a neural network that performs the regularization, add the means back in, and then recombine the patches to get a new image. So one of the things that we did is we tried to take this idea and fold it into the Neumann network. So we're still using that overall Neumann network architecture, only now those regularization blocks explicitly take this, this patch structure into account. So here are some, some peak SNR numbers for um, each with each row corresponding to a different size training data set. And what we see is that if we've got big patches, 64 by 64, then the Neumann network gets a PSNR of 29 when we've got 100 training images. Now, if I want to boost that PSNR up to 32 or higher, then what this table is showing me is that I've got two possible courses of action that I can take. One, I can just reduce the patch size in my reconstruction method. And immediately that gives me a big boost in performance. An alternative, and, and the amount of boost in performance that I'm getting is equivalent to the amount of boost I would get if I uh, increase the size of my training data set by an order of magnitude. So by looking at smaller patches, we've got a less complex uh, geometry space that we have to learn 
Uh, I also believe that this is going to make us more robust to kind of weird shaped tumors in the context of MRI. Uh, and we can do this without having to go through the, the great expense and time of uh, increasing the size of our training sets by orders of magnitude. So one final kind of concluding remark that I wanna make is that when we look at things like the Neumann network or related methods like the gradient descent network, we can think about them from end to end as essentially being just giant neural networks where some of the edge weights are determined by the forward model X. So I've got these, these blocks here, I minus some step size eta times X transpose X. I can certainly think about that or write that down as a neural network, a linear neural network, where some of the edge weights just correspond to elements of X transpose X. So in other words, I can think about these networks that are trying to map observations to reconstructions as being networks that have a com combination of a learned component and a component where the architecture is dictated by, the architecture and the weights are dictated by the physics of my observation system or by the inverse problem at hand. And I think this is sort of an intriguing thought that leads to a, a broader question of whether we can somehow generalize, generally characterize uh, the connections between how we choose neural network architectures and the physical models that might underlie uh, the problem of interest. Uh, so thank you very much. That concludes what I wanted to say today. Um, the main paper that I discussed is available on archive, but since then um, we've published several smaller conference and workshop papers that dive into some of the more subtle details uh, in some more detail. So thank you very much, and I'd be happy to answer any questions.